Hi, I'm John, senior pastor here at the Gender Road Christian Church. We are in the season of Lent, which is a 40-day period leading up to Easter Sunday, Christ's resurrection and victory over sin and death. And so during this Lenten season, I hope you're able to pray or to fast or take on some new spiritual discipline, which helps deepen your relationship with Christ. I encourage you to follow along in your own Bible as you hear God's Word read. Let's get started. And we say that response, Christ is risen. Let us read from the Gospel of John and hear that Christ has indeed risen. From the Gospel of John, chapter 20, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb, and the two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have taken him, and I will go take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary... And she turned and said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. We join me in our litany of praise as found on the overhead or in your bulletin. The stone has been rolled away. The body is gone. Can the words of the angels be true? Let us proclaim with Mary. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Will you stand? Let's be, let's be in prayer. Lord God, we are here worshiping you. Lord, that's something that only we can do uh, here and with you. Lord, may we understand that this day we've, we've set aside this moment. We set aside to come and worship you, to pronounce that you are our Savior, our King. And Lord, we know that you have succeeded in that resurrection. It's your power that comes forth. And Lord, so we come here today, we open ourselves to you so that your Holy Spirit lifts us up and moves us. We worship you, Lord, because by worshiping you first, you being our ground, our foundation, the love upon which we guide all of our actions and our thoughts through the leading of your Holy Spirit, then Lord, the rest of our day moves forward. We worship you first. And Lord, may we carry the spirit of worship out into the world. May we carry it as, as in our personal prayer time and devotions for you. And Lord, we humbly, humbly pronounce you as our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. We want to light the Paschal candle. This candle here, we always bring the light of Christ into the sanctuary. That's what the two candles on the communion table, on the Lord's table, pronounce for us. But in lighting of the the Paschal candle, hear now these words from the Gospel of John. 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was life, and the life was the light of all humanity, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. After I say Christ is our light, will you repeat, thanks be to God. Christ is our light, thanks be to God. May we pray, eternal God, giver of light and life, bless this new flame that by its radiance and warmth we may respond to your love and grace and be set free from all that separates us from you and from each other. Through Jesus Christ, the Son of Righteousness, amen. May the light of the Christ rising in glory illumine our hearts and our minds. Christ is our light. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we come back together, I'd like to read to you from the New Testament in Acts. It's Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. We've heard from the Gospel of John on the resurrection of Jesus. But that resurrection of Jesus, we are invited to be part of something. We realize that in that in the gospel, in Jesus Christ rising, that that is not the end, but it's truly the beginning. It's the beginning of the story. And we see that whether you read from the gospel of Mark or the gospel of John, that we are invited to go out and tell the news and spread the news. So here now is Peter speaks in Acts. Then Peter began to speak to them. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Let's read that again. Then Peter began to speak to them. Truly, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. That God shows no partiality as to who you are, what color of skin you, you have, what part of the world that you are from. But in every nation, anyone who fears him, by fear him that means respects, loves, has accepted him as savior, and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. And that message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Amen. I would invite our children or youth or anybody who feels young at heart, will you come forward? Because um, you remember last week, Jesus led us in our, in our shouts of Hosanna and praise around Jerusalem. Well, I think he might be coming back with a story. So I encourage you to come up here and sit on these steps. And we'll see if Jesus appears. Where could Jesus be? Come on up, everybody. Anybody young? Young at heart? All right. There's some more fun stuff. Did you guys know we're having an Easter egg hunt? Yeah. Yeah, right after the service. You know it. We're, having, we're going to be hunting Easter eggs out behind the church at the shelter house. There we go. Oh, who's coming? It looks like, it looks like, who is it? I'll give you three hints. I was born in a stable. I performed a few miracles. And three days ago, I died. But here I stand. Good as new. Yeah? That's right. <laughs> I'm so glad to see all of you here today. That's wonderful that we're 
gathered to celebrate. Yes. Well, you know something? I, I got to tell you, the singer in your praise band has a really awesome voice. You know what? That guy's good. You know? Hey, look, I brought you something. See? Are you all ready to go outside after church and pick up as many of these as possible? Good deal. Let's hear it. I like it. All right. Well, me too. Me too. All right. Well, maybe you'll get to home real soon. I hope we find a bunch after church. But how about I give one of you a head start on collecting your Easter eggs? I'll give this egg to the one person who can correctly answer my question. Okay? Now, here's the question. What are we remembering today as we celebrate Easter? That's right. Come on down here. That Jesus is risen. All right. Jacob. Now, you all ready to see what's inside the egg? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Anybody have a guess what's in there? Can you tell? No. Oh. All right. All right. Okay, good guesses. Okay. Now, on the count of three, I'm going to open the egg and we'll all see what's inside. You ready? Are we ready? Okay. One, two, three. It's empty. Well, well here, I'm going to give it to you anyway. There you go. You sit down. Good man. So let me ask you, how would you feel if you went outside after church and all of the eggs that you found were empty? What do you think? Would you be disappointed? Yes. Yes. Well, why do you think you'd be disappointed? Yes? Because there is because there is nothing in there. Yeah. You expect candy, some kind of nice surprise, Easter time. I understand. Well, the empty egg reminds me of what the disciples went through when they came to visit my tomb after I died. Now, there were two women who made it to the tomb first, and they were both named Mary. Well, they were very sad and grieved because I had died. They might not get to see me anymore. Well, when they came to the tomb, the stone was rolled away, and my body was gone. The tomb was empty. Well, but when the tomb was empty, what did that mean? Where was I? Where was I? Can anyone say where I was? Well, but I rose again. I was alive. Now, the disciples, the disciples and Mary, they were confused and they were afraid. Because when they got to the tomb, my body was gone. But a wonderful thing happened. I was alive. And not only that, but it meant that I was going to ascend into heaven and that I was going to watch over all of you and live in your hearts. So, let me ask you another question. Would you rather have all the candy or all the coins in the world or... Would you rather know that you could live with me in heaven someday? What would you rather have? <laughs> well, I want to tell you that when you go outside today and you find some eggs that are empty, if you do, I want you to remember something that those are the best eggs of all, and that's the secret. Because when you do, I want you to remember the story of the empty tomb and the promise that I am alive and that I live in your hearts and I love you every single day.
Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Amen. Lord. Thank you. Take care. Bye now. Happy Thank hunting. Thank you, Jesus, for that story. Good All the man. children are welcome to go back and sit Thank with you. their families. Jesus, I'm glad you got to tell that story today. Let's save. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to uh, 1 Corinthians. You'll find that in the New Testament. So we want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. This is where the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he's talking about the resurrection of Christ. And he's trying to get them to understand, because there were some in the church that really thought that they knew better, that there maybe there wasn't a resurrection, and what does it mean to have this new body in Christ? Paul says, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaimed to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, to which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have, become to believe, unless you have come to believe in vain. Let me read that again, because there's some key parts in here. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand to which also you are being saved. See, we've heard that message proclaimed to us, and we believe, and we trust, and we come to church, and we worship. It is the good news, it's the words of Jesus, the love of Jesus upon which we stand, and in which we are being saved. So we're being saved. We haven't just been saved once, but we are continuing to be saved. That saving grace of Jesus Christ continues to come to each one of us. And Paul says, for I handed on to you as of first importance what in turn I had received. So Paul is saying, I have received a proclamation, an anointing from God. I have received this good news. And as I have received it, I am handing it on to you. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That Christ died in accordance with the scriptures. And back then, those would have been the Hebrew scriptures. They didn't have the New Testament as we have now. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of whom are still alive, though some have died. So Paul goes through this list of people that Jesus Christ has appeared to. Interestingly though, he doesn't talk about the women. All the other four gospels talk about how Jesus Christ appeared to uh, the women at the tomb. But this letter was written about 54 AD. The Gospels really weren't put, in, put into writing until about 20 to 50 years later. So Paul, who did not directly witness the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, would have been sharing what he heard directly from those who were witnessing it. And of course, we know that not one person would have witnessed every single event. And then he writes, then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. So remember when Paul had his conversion from Saul to Paul on the road to Damascus, the bright light came upon him. And that was the conversion when Saul became Paul. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. And Paul says, I'm really the last person that should be credible that can go out and, and, and spread the news of who Jesus Christ is because I was persecuting the church. I was putting to death those who were worshiping Jesus Christ. But you know, when he does that, he kind of echoes a little bit what we do, right? Well, you know, who am I to really go out and minister? Who am I to really go out and care for others? Who am I to really go out and spread the word of God? Who am I really to go out and evangelize? Who am I really to go out and share my faith? Who am I really to say, well, yeah, I believe in God? Because we always want to like say we're not qualified or maybe don't have those right credentials. But here we see where Paul, Paul says in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Paul never had an issue with self-confidence. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. And so Paul gives credit to God two times, though, for what he does. 
the grace of God that has saved him. And we can see that it's that personal transformation of Jesus Christ in the life of Paul that gives witness to what Jesus Christ can do. It's that grace of God. Have we ever come to that part in our life where it's like, I am alive by the grace of God? Maybe you've heard somebody say that, or maybe you've said that. Maybe you've had almost a life-threatening, life-ending illness, or you've been in a wreck, a wreck, or maybe you've overcome addictions. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. You know, this world gets so focused on the culture and the power and the might, but when we come here and proclaim Jesus Christ as our written Lord and Savior, in doing that, we do something that is unique because our spirit, ourselves, set aside some of that personal pride, and we realize that there's this humbleness within us that says, you know, I can't do what I do without the grace of God that covers me, that forgives me, that allows me to say I'm sorry to someone, that allows me to maybe keep my mouth quiet and listen to what the other person is actually saying, but by the grace of God. You know, we've come here today, Easter time, we're expecting a lot of things, right? The kids expect to find money or jelly beans or chocolate or something inside those Easter eggs, But what do we expect? What do we assume on Easter? Maybe you've not been into church since Good Friday, or maybe not since last Sunday, or maybe not since Christmas time, but you've come here today. You've come here to to understand and hear the story of Jesus Christ's resurrection, and that is true, but you know what? That is just the beginning. That is just the beginning, because in that resurrection of Jesus Christ, he has to ascend up to the Father, We know that the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension are all one component that comes together to glorify God. And in doing so, we receive that salvation. The resurrection. The story's not over. We don't go home and say, well, that's done. Now let's bring out the ham. No. This is just the beginning because we are invited because in all of these, Jesus is instructing those who go to the tomb, go and tell somebody about it. Go and tell the other disciples, even though they may not understand it. Go and tell others. Jesus Christ appears to them. We are invited to be part of that story. And then we're also challenged with that question, what will I do? What will I do when I experience Jesus Christ? Because I can easily stand here and say, well, if Jesus Christ appeared to me and said, go tell someone about it, I would go do that. But how many times when we are talking with somebody, do we hold back from telling them of our faith? Or maybe you've had a really awesome dream that you think is a vision from God. Well, I don't want to say that because they're going to think I'm crazy, right? Or maybe you've had a revelation in a Bible study or you've had something that's really happened in your life that you can attribute to nothing else but God's hand in your life. Who do you tell about it? How do we participate in that story? And one of the ways that we participate in that story is that when we come to church and worship, we become more comfortable praising God. We become more comfortable with how God is in our life, right? To use sort of a weird analogy, when you first meet somebody, do you often invite them over for Christmas morning celebration, right? No, you don't know them. Would you invite them over for Christmas morning to open gifts? You got to get to know them a little bit. How many people would marry someone after just one date, So there's this awkwardness, right, sometimes in our relationship. Well, that's the same way that as we believe in God, we want to know, we want to come here and hear more than just about God and about Jesus, but to experience Jesus. So as you worship and as you sing and as you have freedom to move yourself and as you have freedom to read the scriptures and as you have freedom then to discuss that with your partner, your spouse, or your kids, you start then to be more willing to pray to God and say, okay, this is where I need your help. And in doing so, there's comfort because God just isn't something out here or God just isn't something out there. God, you realize, is within you and part of who you are and how you've made is this person that glorifies God and can't wait to be in communion with God, to be in that mountaintop experience. You feel as comfortable saying, yeah, this is who I am. This is what I do at church. This is what I believe. 
And in doing so, it doesn't mean that you isolate or, 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 or keep people away or exclude people, because what did Jesus do? What did Peter tell us in Acts? God shows no partiality. We love all people. Our job is to proclaim the news. Our job is to go out and set aside our assumptions. Our job is to go out and help people understand what God is doing in the world and with love. You see, we've come here with certain assumptions today, right? But how do you leave from church to proclaim this invitation of what Jesus Christ is doing for you? Sometimes we're a little eager and a little shocked. A little eager and shocked that Jesus Christ has come to us with his resurrection body. Sometimes we're a little eager and shocked that God is sending to us this way of forgiveness. How comfortable are we in doing that, in accepting that, in treating others with that message? We're eager, we want to do it, but yet we're uncomfortable with that. by the grace of God. Think about that. What in your life right now happened to you because of the grace of God? But by the grace of God, I what? Maybe it's just as simple as today is a gift from God for you. Today is a gift from God. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with it? How will you leave your change? How are your assumptions about who God is and what God has done through the resurrection been changed? But by the grace of God. Amen. I hope the message you've heard today has been a blessing to you, and I know God's Holy Spirit will continue to, to work with you on that message as you understand God's will for your life. If you have questions, give me a call. Contact us here at the Gender Road Christian Church. And may God's blessing be with you during this period of Lent.